Let's open our Bibles up to James chapter 1, and we want to look tonight at verses 19 through 21. James chapter 1, beginning at verse 19. And James, after having just told his fellow Christians that we are begotten by the word of truth, is going to encourage them, encourage us in living godly lives. And so he writes in verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Swift to hear and slow to speak. Someone has said that's why God gave us two ears and one mouth, so that we would listen twice as much as we talk. When I bring up something like this, my son is usually pretty quick to say, Dad, you need to listen to that. He usually tells me when that country song comes on, you say it best when you say nothing at all. He says, Dad, that, that, that's you. But uh, here he's reminding us that we need to be swift to hear. And it may be in particular that he's talking about hearing the Word of God, that Word that we are begotten by. And so we want to make sure that we are spending time in God's Word. But just think about how valuable this is in living the kind of lives God wants us to live. Being swift to hear. Being ready to listen. You can learn a lot by listening. And certainly we can let others know how much we appreciate them. How interested we are in what they have to say when we listen. And so he says, be swift to hear, but slow to speak. In other words, give, give thought. I, I know you'll be shocked by this, but when I was in high school, my English teacher gave to every student an award at the end of the year. And the award that I received, I still remember, was the student most likely to start his mouth without his mind in gear. Well, I, I've tried to learn from that. But here he reminds us, give thought. Because words, they can get us into trouble. In fact, James is going to talk a lot about the tongue as we study this book. But he says, you be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. The wrath of man he reminds us, does not accomplish. It doesn't bring about the righteousness of God. The Apostle Paul writes about this idea of, of wrath over in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 6, where he reminds us, Be ye angry, and what? Sin not. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Now, that's a lot easier to say than it is to do. But we often will get ourselves into trouble when we lose our temper. It leads us to think things, to say things, and to do things that we normally would not do. I am sure that if we were to take some kind of survey of the penitentiaries throughout our state, throughout our country, you would find that they are filled with people who lost their temper for just a little while. Who, if they could take back actions that only took a few moments, everything could be different. And so we've got to be careful about how we deal with anger. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, he reminds us. For in verse 20, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. One person said that wrath is a bad fruit from a bad tree. There's nothing good that comes from it in most cases. And so here he reminds us as Christians to seek to control our tongues and control our anger. And then he tells us in verse 21, Wherefore, Lay aside or lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. When's the last time you used the word superfluity in a sentence? We don't use that term very often, but it's a, a good term. 
It means an overabundance. You think about filling a bucket up with water. When it gets to the top and you keep putting stuff in, that's superfluity. It's overflowing. And so he says, you've got to get rid of this. Lay this aside. If we're going to serve Christ, can't continue in wickedness. And certainly we know that as Christians that there are things that we have to put off. Certainly there are things that we put on in Christ, but there are those things that we put off. Remember in Colossians chapter 3, beginning at about verse 8, we're told, But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And so James, just like Paul, is telling us there are things that we have to put off. Don't let these things be a part of your life anymore. Set them aside. And then, he says, receive with meekness. There's a humility here. You know, this evening we had couple of our granddaughters, I guess three of our granddaughters at the house. And I was, I, again, I know you'll find this hard to believe, but I was aggravating them a little bit. And I was actually standing in Jordan's way. Jordan was watching television and I got in between her and the television and she said, get out of the way. I said, say please. She would not. And so I would not move. Five minutes we're doing this, you know, and and she would not give in. Well, I think she gets that from Tammy. But, But when it comes to God's Word, we need to make sure we're not stubborn. We're not going to do it our way no matter what. No, we are going to submit ourselves, humbly obey, with meekness, We're going to receive the engrafted word, the implanted word. It makes us think of Jesus' parable of the sower. And we remember in Luke chapter 8 and about verse 11 where he tells us that the word is the seed or the seed is is the word of God. And when that word is planted in our hearts, it can take root and it can produce fruit. And the fruit that it produces is the salvation of our souls. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. God's word can save our souls when we apply it to our lives, when we humbly submit to it, when we obey it. And so he reminds us as Christians, let's be careful in our actions in our words. Let's be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. And remember, the wrath of man, it doesn't bring about the righteousness of God. It doesn't accomplish that. And so let's lay aside all this filthiness and this superfluity, this overabundance of naughtiness. Let's put off that old man and let's receive in meekness, humility, the engrafted or implanted word that's able to save our souls. I know that most of you have made that decision and that you're so thankful that you have. You have obeyed God's word that is able to save our souls. But if you're here tonight and you're not yet a Christian, you haven't obeyed what God would have you to do, what he's told us in his word, we want to encourage you to take that step tonight. Because, as the Bible tells us here, it truly is able to save our souls when we obey the Word of God. And so if that's the step you need to take, we're ready to assist you. That last step being being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. And if you're here as one who has obeyed but you've fallen away and, and you need to come back, we'd love to pray with you and for you. Will you think about these things? It's heaven's invitation. If you're subject in any way, please come as together we stand and sing.